Long before Titus defended Avarax, long before Cadia decided to stand in, in pieces, Games Workshop found another way to sell more Space Marines. Set 10,000 years before Warhammer 40k, this is the background and mythology of the setting. In 64 books, the Iliad and the Odyssey combined are only 48. Take that, Greece. The Horus Heresy After ChatGPT rebelled and humanity's first galactic empire fell apart, a man of godlike power, humbly known as the Emperor of Mankind, decided to launch his great crusade to unite the worlds of humanity into the Imperium of Man. These were the good times. Sure, his sons had been mysteriously scattered throughout the galaxy as infants, and sure, there were various Xenos civilizations that rudely decided not to just roll over and die, but on the whole there were many laughs, and lots and lots of purging. All of the Emperor's sons, the Primarchs, were eventually found, and these 20, I mean 18, I mean 19 demigods were truly the best when it comes to genetically engineered super warriors. They were perhaps the greatest generals the galaxy has ever known. And Lehman Russ. Each Primarch is unique, except for the ones that are kind of the same, and each leads their Space Marine Legion, the Emperor's Angels of Death. Vast armies of super soldiers with a myriad of incredible abilities, although most of them very rarely come up in the books. As the Great Crusade neared its peak, the Emperor returned to Earth, which is called Terra for some reason, and he will tell nobody why, partially because it's a secret project and partially because he genuinely likes to mess with his sons. Seriously, he's a terrible dad. In wake of this, the Emperor's first found, if you have not read that Alpharius novel, son Horus Lupercal, is raised to a level above his brothers. He now commands the Great Crusade with the title of War Master. And to mark his promotion, he will give his legion a particularly uninspired name change. However, the four Chaos Gods of Nurgle, Angry, Blue and Nipple Play oppose the Emperor. They call him their anathema because they thought Neoth sounded silly, and he was such a threat that they took a break in their great game to bring him down. Servants of the Chaos Gods, and most importantly, this absolute turd, worked desperately to turn Horus against his father. They basically killed him, showed him twisted visions and half-truths, and used the memory of his dead son to manipulate him. But Horus was a genius demigod of humanity and saw through these lies, yet ultimately sided with the Chaos Gods anyway when he sees a future where some of his brothers get a statue and he doesn't. Fair enough. So he decided to burn the entire galaxy down anyway. That's the galaxy burn. Thanks Horus. What followed was a civil war so devastating that half the plot points in 40k have their roots here. Things like the Terminus Decree, the Inquisition, why these guys have red helmets, and you know, the Tyranid Invasion. Horus was revived, empowered as the chosen champion of the Dark Gods. Then he'll go through the gate at Molek into the realm of chaos itself and return empowered as the chosen champion of the Dark Gods. Then he'll be brought low by the Spear of Rus, but after his son's sacrifice, he'll return empowered as the ch uh, for the love of God, can we just get to the Siege of Terror? Fortunately, Horus's brother Magnus the Red had foreseen the War Master's betrayal, and so he decided to make a meme. To warn his father, Magnus attempts a magical Zoom meeting from across the galaxy. Despite the fact that the Emperor had said no more magic and not to disturb him during his special alone time. In his attempt, Magnus will blow past the magical wards protecting the Imperial Palace and allow demons to almost overwhelm the birthplace of humanity. Whoops. Only by the Emperor being bound to a powerful device, the Golden Throne is the birth world of humanity saved. Henceforth, from the galaxy's most powerful chair, the Emperor is unable to properly join the fight against the traitors. Over time, Magnus and seven other Primarchs will join Horus in his rebellion for various reasons, but primarily conceptual symmetry. And for the most part, you won't really be surprised who, as it's either the Primarchs that the Emperor insults or humiliates, or the Primarchs who grew up on planets whose main export was crime. 
Seriously though, Mortarion is obsessed with the number 7 and Gron and Kurz just outright hate the Emperor. This, this, this can't have come as a great surprise. Anyway, as well as turning on their father, some of the traitor Primarchs will embrace the powers of chaos and ascend to demonhood. This will grant them almost godlike abilities on the battlefield, but this won't matter as much as you'd think as it also seems to make them the worst teammates imaginable. The nine traitor sons will take on team, sort of well adjusted but not really, the nine Primarchs loyal to the Emperor. They will be the bulwark against the traitor forces, brave and true, and the Emperor's greatest war of- Ferris, is that- a, is that a wrench? Why did you bring a wrench? Be horrified as brother turns on brother, but enjoy the apocalyptic battles. Like the burning of Prospero, when Lehman Russ had his orders manipulated by the War Master. So instead of attempting to bring Magnus in quietly, he will not bring him in, and loudly. On Istvan 3, Horus will have his sons and three other legions purge their ranks of marines too loyal to the Emperor and especially those who didn't join the secretive warrior lodges, because above all else, the War Master hates those who don't take advantage of fun extracurricular activities. One ship escapes however, and so a retribution force of seven legions is sent to snuff out the heresy. This would have worked really well if it weren't for the fact that four of those seven legions had secretly thrown in with the War Master. They turned their guns on the three loyal legions, who would not be able to properly recover until after the heresy. On Kalth, the word bearers will delight in betraying the Ultramarines, as revenge for when the Blueberries destroyed the perfect city of Monarchia. Some loyal sons will be unable to take the fight to the enemy as a gigantic warp phenomenon dubbed the Ruin Storm cuts large portions of the galaxy off from the Emperor's guiding light. However, these three Primarchs will try to salvage what they can in Imperium Secundus and prove once and for all that blondes do have more fun. The series will reach its epic conclusion in the Siege of Terror. Sanguinius will get the noble death that he deserves. Oh. Never mind then. But most importantly, the Emperor will be able to finally defeat Horus before he is bound to the Golden Throne for the next 10,000 years. There are so many incredible battles and stories. So start your journey today, only 54 books to go and a boatload of novellas. Then it's just the Siege of Terror, which is another 10. Or you can actually play the game where you'll choose your favorite Primarch and Legion and engage in the sci-fi version of My Dad Could Beat Up Your Dad. You can pick from King Arthur and the Knights of the Round War Crimes, Instagram influencers armed with boom boxes, off-brand Lego, the Fast and the Furious, but more realistic. The Wolfy Wolf Wolf Wolf. <laughs> ah. Store-brand Lego, Batman with foresight and murder, Team Edward with wings, placeholder to change later, some sort of joke about losing your head, I don't know. My name is Angron of New Syria, Lord of the Red Sands, Primarch of the World Eaters Legion, disloyal servant to the Emperor. No one ever pronounces your name correctly. And I'm not going to start now. Rubber Boot Gorilla Glue, COVID-14, Harry Potter, and the Dusty Hallows. You were the chosen one! Poor critical reasoning skills. The good guys, unless you're that one elder child. That feeling you have when you're a teenager and no one really gets you. And finally, the parent trap. The Lindsay Lohan version. Daddy Issues in Space. I'm really never going to get over the fact that they named the oldest person in the galaxy, Ol Person. <laughs>